my dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are watching this program live from facebook page and youtube channel i'd like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar hope you are well and from corona pandemic so as we know that we are staying in a corona pandemic situation and situation becoming worse day by day so we have to uh, follow our health rules so it's very difficult for us to continue our normal academic program inside the campus so we have to start our online program i think you have already come to know that the department of physics pabna university of science and technology has started this online program including online international physics webinar and i'm happy to share with you all that we have successfully completed our 210th international physics webinar including three novel laureate speaker and today it's our 211th international uh, physics webinar and today we would like to uh, welcome you all through a joint session between our department uh, department of physics from the university of science and technology and the department of physics college of arts and science uh, case western uh, reserve university in usa and we have with us here today uh, dr harsh mathur sir professor department of physics uh, college of arts and sciences uh, case western reserve university usa and he has already connected with us so i'd like to welcome our speaker sir good morning and good evening to here so thanks for accepting our invitation sir and we would like to say thanks on the behalf of the department of physics of the university of science and technology for accepting our invitation sir it's a great opportunity for our students and viewers to interact with you through online sir and it's my honor and ple pleasure sir to host you in our international physics web so before going to you sir uh, i would like to introduce you with uh, my student and viewers so dear student and viewers i think you have already come to know that the title of this today's international physics webinar and the title is classical analogs of quantum phenomena from jammed solid to the notorious blg and our uh, speaker is dr harsh mathur sir professor at department of physics college of arts and sciences at case western reserve university usa i think you will enjoy this exciting uh, webinar so we can see uh, his uh, educational and experience uh, so he has completed his btech from the indian institute of technology kanpur in 1987 and then mphil from yale university in physics in 1989 and then phd from yale university in physics in 1994 and uh, he started his uh, career as a postdoctoral uh, member on a technical staff at the bell laboratory uh, and he stayed there uh, up to uh, august uh, 1995 and then he joined as a general member at the institute for theoretical physics university of california uh, and he stayed there up to may 1996 and then he joined as a assistant professor at the case western reserve university and he stayed there july uh, 2001 as a assistant professor and then warren roop assistant professor at the same university uh, june 2001 and now currently he is working as an uh, associate professor sorry professor uh, at the same department at the same university so this is his awards and honor uh, in 1996 to 2000 alfred p sloan foundation fellow and in 1992 to 1993 ibm post doctoral fellow and this is his research into the main focus of his research has been condensed matter theory a second area of uh, interest is the theoretical particle astrophysics and cosmology in condensed matter physics his main interests are quantum many body physics and quantum effect in disordered materials in particle astrophysics and cosmology he is interested in the early universe as a probe of high energy physics in the cosmic micro background as a probe of the early universe and in non perturbative phenomena in quantum field theory other interdisciplinary interests are grouped under a uh, missionary blue so this is uh, his publication list so thanks all of your patience uh, it's time to go to our speaker sir uh, thanks again for joining with us it's uh, it's my honor sir to host you sir yeah. i think uh, you can start your session sir yeah thank you uh, this has been a really difficult year uh, for everyone yes. everywhere uh, but you know one of the wonderful things is a series like this where people are trying to uh, connect in spite of all the yes. hardships we are under Uh, so i'm really honored and uh, delighted to be part of the series and i hope someday i can actually visit in person as well yeah of course of course, of course after the uh, yeah. covid uh, will definitely invite you sir for festival yeah. session that will be wonderful yeah 
uh, for, for now, uh, I guess this is this is how we communicate. So yeah. let's go yeah. forward. And uh, so uh, I, I want to talk about um, about a variety of phenomena that are fundamentally classical in nature, but they're analogous to quantum effects uh, that are actually of quite a lot of interest these days. Um, I'll be talking about uh, jammed solids and bilayer graphene and uh, some, of, some, of, some of the things as well as we go along. Um, one thing I want to say is that if you have uh, questions, I know we'll be having more, more of the discussion at the end of the talk, but uh, feel free to send in questions or clarifications in the middle as well. Um, uh, my, my goal is not necessarily to get through uh, any particular set of topics, but just to uh, you know, introduce uh, some, some things in, 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 in some detail. So I've tried to make this accessible, uh, assuming you've had uh, basic course in mechanics and so forth. Um, all right, so let's dive in. OK, so this slide I'm going to skip over. Actually, it's from another version of this talk that I gave um, when this was the view outside my window, but that's not the case anymore. Um, also, let me skip over this. Uh, I do want to take a minute and tell you a little bit more about our, our, our university and department. So this is one of the oldest physics departments in the country. Um, it's the home of the Michelson and Morley experiment um, from 1887, which was the basis of uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, at present, uh, what we have is, oh, and I should explain this picture as well. Uh, what this picture shows is the small apple tree that was presented to us by the National Science Foundation. Um, it's, a, it's an offshoot of the famous apple tree that grew in Newton's garden. And so I guess we're just waiting for it to grow a little bit more and bear fruit. And I suppose that's when we'll start to do our best work. Um, so what we have uh, over here currently is um, research in three, three basic areas, in cosmology, particle physics, and astrophysics, uh, in condensed matter physics, and in biophysics and medical imaging, of which I'm involved in the first two areas. So uh, since I want to talk mostly about my work on the condensed matter side of uh, things today, I want to briefly mention that in cosmology, uh, the kinds of questions that uh, I'm interested in are uh, questions like, uh, is Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity, uh, really the best way to think about gravity, or, or are there possibly is, is some modification of it perhaps necessary? Um, another question that's, that's of interest is, uh, did the universe undergo this epoch of inflation? And if it did, how would we find out? And galaxy rotation, I guess that actually goes back to the same question about uh, the law of gravity. Um, I'm also interested in topological defects. Uh, but this is all the stuff that I don't want to talk about, although I'm happy to entertain questions about it afterwards, if there's any interest. Especially that picture, you might be wondering whether it's spilled coffee and uh, chameleon there are doing. Uh, I can explain that. Um, I'm, I also have an interest in um, interdisciplinary science. So this goes a little bit beyond physics uh, into the history of science. Um, there was a project, there have been some projects that involve art history. Uh, there was a project involving the paintings of Jackson Pollock, of which you can see an example over there um, to, to the left. And a question about whether one can use computer image analysis to tell if these paintings are authentic. Um, also, I'm interested in uh, computational linguistics. Uh, but these are exactly the things I'm not planning to talk about. I just wanted to mention. And what I want to do is now move on to um, the topic of the day, which is, as I said, uh, trying to understand some phenomena that can be that are entirely classical in nature, but are remarkably similar to uh, to quantum phenomena that are of great interest currently. Um, here's a sort of laundry list of the quantum effects that one can find in purely classical systems. Uh, at this point, I don't necessarily need you to be familiar with any of these things, supersymmetry, topological defects, or topological insulators, or quantum chaos. Uh, these are just the things we'll be talking about. And the talk is meant to be self-contained. And I'll try and explain that. But uh, what, what I do want you to take away from this slide is this remarkable fact that you can have systems that are classical, but they behave in a way that's quantum. OK, so um, I'm going to start off with supersymmetry, and then we'll move on to topological defects and insulators, and finally, quantum chaos. That's the outline of the talk. Um, so let's start with supersymmetry in mechanical systems. 
Um, so the ideas that I'm going to describe actually are not new. They go back all the way to, but this is a new way of looking at them, which brings out the fact that mechanical systems can show supersymmetry. Um, but the basic ideas really go back to Maxwell. And uh, the, this new way of thinking about it was introduced by Kane and Lubensky uh, in an important paper in 2014. Uh, my contribution here is largely pedagogical. I believe I found a really clear and simple example through which one can explain these ideas. And so that's what I want to try and do. Um, so this is a problem you may be familiar with from your classical mechanics course, which is that you have these three atoms, these three point masses, and they're connected by springs. Uh, that's it. It's just point masses connected by springs. They form an equilateral triangle, and we'll assume that the particles lie in a plane and they're not, and, and they're confined to the plane. So the question is, what are the vibrational frequencies of this molecule? And so that's the normal mode problem, which you may be familiar with from your mechanics classes. Uh, I want to look at this normal mode problem in a slightly different way than you may have done in your class, where maybe you used a Lagrangian formulation. Um, the key thing over here is that uh, each of the atoms, there's an equilibrium configuration of the molecule, which is an equilateral triangle. And then you can deform the molecule. So each of the atoms can be displaced um, from equilibrium. And those are the displacements. X1 and Y1 are the X and Y displacements of, molecule, of atom 1, and X2 and Y2 of atom 2, and so on. So you can see that there are six basic degrees of freedom, the displacements that are listed over there. Um, and then we've got uh, the bond extensions. Uh, as you move the atoms away from equilibrium, the bonds will become, or the springs, if you like, will become longer or shorter. And so that's an important quant set of quantities, how much the springs have been elongated. Those are the bond extensions, and there's three of them. Uh, if you stop and think a little bit about it, when the de deformation of the molecule is small, then the bond extensions are proportional to the displacements. And that idea is um, captured by this equation, which I've written just below the figure, the one that says delta L is A times X. So what this equation is saying is, um, uh, now X over here is short for a column vector consisting of all the displacements, and delta L is short for a column vector consisting of the bond extensions. So the vector on the left has three components, X has six components, so you can see that the matrix A that connects the two, the matrix of coefficients, must be a three by six matrix. Uh, in fact, it's easy to work out what the entries of this matrix are, uh, because if you think about it, when you displace, let's say, atom number one, if you look at the figure, imagine displacing just atom number one and not the others, uh, you can see that what matters as far as elongating the bond is concerned is the component of the displacement, which is parallel to the spring, parallel to the equilibrium position of the spring, the dis component of the displacement, which makes a 60 degree angle with the X axis. That's what matters. The perpendicular component is irrelevant to first order. So in that way, by taking some sines and cosines, uh, by taking components of these displacement vectors along the spring, you can figure out what the matrix A is. OK, so, so that's uh, simple enough. And it's something you could, you could have done in your classical mechanics course. Um, but now, once we've got the bond extensions worked out, we'd also like to think about what are the forces um, exerted by the springs on these point masses. And so there's going to be six force components, because the force on atom one has an x and y component and so on. And these forces are proportional to the bond extensions, because that's what springs do. Um, the force is proportional to how much you stretch it. Uh, the remarkable thing is that this relationship is uh, again captured by the same matrix A, or rather it's transpose. So the six four components are given by A transpose acting on the bond extensions times the spring constant. Uh, for simplicity, I'm assuming that the springs are all identical and the point masses are all identical. It's not necessary, but we're trying to do the simplest example. OK, so if that's all good, uh, we're ready to go on. Um, I mean, this seems like uh, physics 101. But as you'll see, this will, very quickly, we get into supersymmetry now. Um, well, let's continue solving this uh, molecule. So we want to write down f is equal to ma. Um, so the ma side is easy. It's d squared x. x, again, remember, is a column vector of all the six displacements. Um, and so we differentiate every one of them. That's what the left-hand side is. And then the force is, well, you can see what's going on over there. a times x gives you the bond extensions, and then apply A transpose to that and multiply by K, and that gives you the forces, or by minus K, and that gives you the forces. And so that's F is equal to MA right there for you. 
Um, so A transpose A is a six by six matrix. And if you figure out its eigenvalues and eigenvectors, those are called the normal modes of the problem. And those are the, and the eigenvalues are the squares of the frequencies. So this is standard stuff that you may have seen in your mechanics course. Uh, but here's where now we can deviate from the standard approach and uh, the fun begins. So the fun thing is that the matrix A, A transpose um, is a three by three matrix, as I've noted over there, the, the bottom line of the slide. So A transpose A is actually the one that comes up in F is equal to MA. And uh, we want to figure out its frequencies. But the interesting thing is that A transpose A is a much smaller matrix. And actually, the two of them have the same relevant frequencies. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, let's go back to what we expect. What frequencies do we expect this molecule to have? Um, again, if this was like real and interactive, I would probably wait for you to answer this question. Um, I think it also helps uh, people stay awake if we're having uh, back and forth. Uh, but I'll just answer my own question myself. Um, the three frequencies that we can just predict uh, right away will be zero. And that's because if you shift the molecule, if you displace all the atoms by the same amount, uh, you don't actually compress the springs. So there's no restoring force for displacing the molecule uh, rigidly. You can displace it in any direction, or you can rotate it also. So three of these frequencies will come out to be 0. And it's the other three which are non-zero. And those are the non-trivial actual vibrational modes of the molecule. The three, three zero modes, the three zero frequencies just tell you that the molecule can also be displaced or rotated. Um, so uh, the fun thing is that the matrix A, A, trans, A, A transpose, which is three by three, its eigenvalues are actually the non-zero frequencies. So that's what the statement means, that the isospectral, isospectral up to zero modes. OK, so that's nice. Uh, but you can take all of this and you can write it in a form that actually makes it exactly match on to what's called supersymmetry in particle physics. What you can do is you can introduce these matrices Q and Q transpose, um, which are actually 9 by 9 matrices. And they're built out of the A and the A transpose in the way that I've indicated over there. Uh, what you can prove is, and this is a good exercise, you should try it out, just multiply those matrices together. You'll see that Q squared and Q transpose squared, both of them square to 0. And then if you work out the anti-commutator of Q, Q transpose and Q, uh, what is the anti-commutator of two matrices? You multiply, what's the anti-commutator of A and B? It's A times B plus B times A. The commutator is the difference of the products in the two orders. The anti-commutator is the sum. So the anti-commutator of these two matrices, it works out to being a big matrix, which is exactly what I've written down in the bottom line. It's um, a transpose A, it's block diagonal. And one block is A transpose A, and the other block is A A transpose. Both matrices whose eigenvalues contain the um, actual interesting vibrational frequencies of our molecule. So we get two copies of the problem. Uh, one of them is called the bosonic copy, and the other is called the fermionic copy. And that doesn't mean anything over here. Uh, the name's bosonic and fermionic. But in context of uh, particle physics, that's the terms they use. So the Qs are called supercharges in particle physics. The matrix H is called a supersymmetric Hamiltonian in particle physics. And uh, these are the the two blocks are called the super the the bosonic and um, fermionic blocks. Um, we won't actually do anything with this, but it's kind of interesting that such a simple problem already contains um, the same structure as in you know some of the most cutting edge theories of particle physics. What I want to do instead is to look at the same problem in another way, uh, which was introduced by Kane and Lubensky. What Kane and Lubensky said is that you take these matrices A and A transpose, and you can assemble them into this matrix, which I call HD. Uh, that's sh uh, short for H Dirac. Um, this is not really Hamiltonian, of course. We're just doing classical mechanics and um, not Hamiltonian mechanics. And there's no quantum, Hamil quantum physics going on over here. But this matrix H is Hermitian. Um, it's actually real symmetric. And the fun thing about this matrix H is that its eigenvalues are the square roots of the eigenvalues of the matrix matrices that we want to solve. So this is how Kane and Lebensky proposed that one can take the square root of a mechanics problem. HD squared is the actual problem we want to solve if you want to figure out the normal modes of this molecule. But you could also solve HD, which is the square root of the problem you want to solve. 
and that will also supply you all the answers. So what's the benefit of going over to HD, the square root problem? Well, we'll come back to that later on. Um, but let's look at this. Uh, so again, uh, let me just pause here for a second and emphasize what the important takeaway is. Uh, we've got this molecule, this vibrating molecule, and it can be characterized by this matrix A. The conventional way of solving the problem is to solve either A transpose A or A A transpose to figure out the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of that. But Ken and Lubinsky say that you could form this Hamiltonian HD and solve that instead. And that's, in some sense, the square root of the mechanics problem you want to solve. That's the really important takeaway. Um, so uh, you can show that this matrix HD has, has a number of interesting problem properties. One is that if you take a eigenvector, if you take a vector and you complex conjugate it, if it's an eigenvector, it will remain an eigenvector. And uh, that's formally shown by showing that the process of conjugating an eigenvector, which is called the time reversal operator, that commutes with the Hamiltonian. Um, and then uh, you can also do what's called conjugation of the eigenvectors, which means you conjugate the, ve the vector and you multiply it by this matrix uh, that's shown on the right. Uh, you can show that this operation anti-commutes with the Hamiltonian. And this assures you that the Hamiltonian HD, its eigenvalues will come in pairs, equal and opposite pairs. And of course, when you square them, they all both square up to the same thing. Um, so, so these symmetries that this Dirac Hamiltonian has uh, puts it in a class, in a special symmetry class called BD1. Uh, what does that mean? Well, uh, I won't do, go into this too much, but there's some very interesting work um, in mathematical physics and in uh, this has implications for all sorts of different fields of uh, uh, quantum physics that quantum, quantum Hamiltonians can be classified into 10 categories depending on their symmetries, whether time reversal is present or absent, and whether the symmetry called charge conjugation is present or absent as well. So, um, so there's been a whole classification, and if you know what class your Hamiltonian belongs to, you can draw upon what is known about other, other uh, Hamiltonians that belong to this class. So that's why it was important to make this observation that the mechanics problem, if you turn it into a square root of itself, um, it turns into something into a quantum-like problem, which belongs to this class BD1. All right, so we've gone a long way from you know triangular molecule to BD1, um, but that's that's part one of the talk. I just wanted to show you how simple mechanics problems can ultimately connect to uh, the frontiers of uh, you know quantum quantum things. Um, let me just pause here for a second and see if there have been any questions uh, or clarifications that might be necessary for part one before we dive into part two. Uh, yes, sir. We have uh, got two questions. So if you, uh, I can add the question. Sure. Uh, please go ahead. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Okay. Can uh, you? Yeah. Uh, okay, so the, this question is actually about bilayer graphene, the one I'm reading over here about ultra-fast electron dynamics. Um, let me come back to this question a little bit later, when, when we get to the bilayer graphene portion. Uh, are there any other questions? Which, uh, which, question. yeah, yeah, this is also. This is also a question about uh, oh, uh, bilayer graphene. Okay, good. So I'll, I'll, I'll come back to both okay. of these questions later on. I'm happy to do okay, so. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, great. So then I guess we'll go on. All right, so let's get to bilayer graphene. Uh, obviously, people are, uh, evidently, people are rightly so quite excited about the subject. Um, and that's why I call it the notorious BLG. Um, so this is actually work that was done quite a few years ago before all the excitement started in bilayer graphene. But of course, the work has now become quite relevant as a result of all of that excitement. And uh, to me, the fun thing about this project was that uh, it was done with a very gifted high school student. So she wanted to work on a summer research project. And um, we didn't really, uh, you know, it was kind of hard to think of what, is, what, what a high school student could meaningfully work on, uh, given that, you know, they don't necessarily know a lot of advanced physics or math. But it turned out she didn't know a lot of advanced physics or math, but she could learn really fast. So, uh, so we wound up doing this project. and. Uh, uh, it's quite remarkable. She's now a 
graduate student at MIT. Uh, I'm sorry, at Stanford. She's an undergraduate at MIT. Um, so, uh, and I should also say, I can. I think I can brag about this because it's entirely to her credit. But this work was uh, a finalist for the Intel Science Talent Prize, which is the most prestigious uh, science prize uh, for high school students in the U.S. Uh, it involves, uh, you know, going to Washington D.C. and uh, yeah, so, so it was kind of a ex exciting thing to be part of. Um, uh, all right, so so let, let, let's uh, without further ado, let's dive into the subject. So I just want to quickly remind you about graphene and bidergraphene. Graphene is this single atomically flat layer of carbon, this new form of carbon that was discovered about 15 years ago, only 15 years ago. And in this form of carbon, the atoms are arranged in a honeycomb pattern like I've shown over here. So let's just re re review um, lattices uh, from solid state physics briefly. Um, I'm not sure if everybody in the audience has had solid state physics. Um, for our undergraduates, it's an elective course. And for our graduate students also, the ones who get into particle physics, they usually have only faint memories of, of, of all the stuff. So I want to pause and review it. Um, so the basic idea in solid state physics is or the idea of a Brave lattice, which is a set of points uh, that are of this form. A and B are two vectors. in a, uh, Let's do this in two dimensions. So A and B are two vectors in a plane. And if you combine them with integer integ coefficients, this, that set of points is called the Bravais lattice. Uh, that's a mathematical way to define a Bravais lattice. Um, another equivalent way, um, which is maybe concept conceptually deeper, is that a Bravais lattice is a set of points where if you go to any one point and you look at its neighborhood, uh, they all they look exactly the same no matter which point you're at. So you can see that this honeycomb pattern is not a Bravais lattice. It fails the test. Because even if all these points are identical, and I've shaded them differently over here, some are dark, some are open circles, and some are dark. But uh, ignore that for a moment. But you can see that the points marked A, the dark circles and the open circles, really are different. Because if you're at a point marked A at one of the dark circles, you've got one neighbor to the left and two to the right, nearest neighbors. But if you go to the points marked B, um, you've got two to the left and one to the right. So it's the opposite situation. But the neighborhoods of all the A's look the same, and the neighborhoods of all the B's look the same. So what we really have over here is um, two triangular lattices that are interpenetrating. OK, so the main takeaway over here for you is that if you have a honeycomb lattice of carbon atoms, although the atoms are all, all identical, nonetheless, in some sense, there are two sublattices, the A and the B sublattice. OK, that's a single layer, a single layer of graphene. Now, if you take two layers of graphene and you put them on top of each other, um, the simplest, you know, the obvious thing to do would be to put them right on top of each other, align them perfectly. So if you're looking from above, the A atoms will be on top of the A atoms, and the B atoms will be on top of the B atoms. And actually, if you look from above, you'll just see one, one honeycomb because they're so perfectly aligned. Well, this is called AA stacking, and this is not what happens in nature. Uh, the reason AA stacking is bad is because the atoms in the different layers don't like to be close to each other. They'd like to be as far apart as possible. And so the way to do that, the stable stackings are actually what are called BA and AB stackings. What you do is you take, uh, again, imagine that you've got these two honeycombs right on top of each other. You start with an AA stacking. And then imagine that you take the upper, lat upper honeycomb and you shift it so that all the A atoms in the upper layer are now on top of the B atoms in the lower layer. So you just slide it diagonally so that the A atoms in the upper layer are on top of the B. You might say, what's the use of that? That seems like the A atoms are still close to another carbon atom. That's true. But if you think about this sliding process, then the B atoms in the upper layer are now at the center of the hexagons. And so they're happy. They're far away from the carbon atoms in the lower layer. So that's called an AB stacking, where the A atoms on top are above the B atoms below. You could also do a BA stacking, where you may, in this AB stacking, the A at upper A atoms are unhappy, and the lower B atoms are unhappy but the other guys are happy, the upper B are happy, and so on. Uh, in a BA stacking, it's the exact opposite, where the upper B are unhappy, but the upper A are happy, and so on. OK, so that's that's bilayer graphene. OK, so there's this, uh, what got us interested in this, and like I said, this is, this is research we did a few years ago, but it's become hugely relevant to now. Um, uh, and I guess this is the one I decided to talk about, because I think it's got this interesting connection to classical mechanics. Um, 
So, so this experiment by um, Paul by uh, Paul McEwen's group at Cornell University um, reported in this paper, uh, Alden et al. Um, what they did was they observed bilayer graphene through uh, uh, scanning microscopy, and what they see is uh, what you see in these pictures um, that there seem to be domains of A, B, and B, A stacking. And that makes sense. If you just slap on two layers on top, one on top of the other, um, in some regions, they'll adopt an A, B stacking. In others, they'll adopt a B, A stacking. And so there'll be domains. And then there'll be domain walls or boundaries between them. And what they found was that these domain walls, these boundaries, that's what you can see in this picture on the left. In the picture on the left, the A, B, and the B, A regions show as light and dark gray. Um, and then the domain walls are the boundaries between those light and dark gray regions. Um, in the image in D, which is color coded, it's the boundaries that are highlighted, and the AB and the BA domains are uh, just the same color. Um, uh, but in any case, uh, the, the interesting thing is that if you zoom in with a scanning tunneling microscope, you can see that these boundaries um, actually are very regular. They form a kind of triangular pa pattern of their own. Uh, it's much larger than the pattern of the bilayer graphene, but it's a, it's a pretty regular pattern. And they sometimes meet in threes. And if you think about that, that's maybe a little surprising. I mean, if you have two lines, of course, they will intersect generically. But if you have three lines, what are the odds that they would all meet at the same point? So it must not be a coincidence. There must be something going on that forces these domain walls to meet in threes, as you can see in this picture, mark A. Um, uh, all of these actual data from the Alden et al. paper. Um, you can go, so, so this is just uh, low resolution or, or low magnification microscopy. But if you go in really deep, uh, you can see that at the, at the place where the three lines intersect, uh, you have AA stacking. And at the places that are far from these domain walls, you have AB or BA stacking. And that's shown in these pictures marked C and D. Um, yeah, I guess I can explain those pictures more of the questions about how C and D show exactly that it's AA and AB stacking. It's interesting. But I want to go on because ultimately, I want to talk about our work, not theirs. Um, but one more thing I need to tell you about their experiment is that um, they can go into these domain walls and they can scan across a wall. And in that way, they can map out what the profile of the wall is. And so they can figure out how wide these walls are. And they find that the two kinds of walls, they're the shear walls, what they call the shear walls and the tensile walls. Um, but for our purposes, what matters is that they found that there were thin walls and fat walls. And they measured their width. And uh, these are known numbers, which you can see at the bottom of the page. OK, so those, that, those are the experiments. That's what we learned about um, from talking to, uh, that's what I learned about from talking to McEwen. And uh, our goal was to uh, try and model this. This was the summer research project for my high school student. Um, OK, so um, this actually was a very short movie. Uh, it's, yeah, there, it's really short. So it's barely worth showing. Uh, it's also not relevant to what I want to talk about, but it's an interesting phenomenon that Alden et al. observed that these domain walls, if you heat up the system a lot, like you know, 1,000 degrees, uh, then these domain walls start to move around, and they move in a jerky sort of way, which you see in this very short movie, which is sped up tremendously. Um, so that's an interesting phenomenon to understand as well. And so far as I know, there's been no work on that in trying to understand why these walls move in this jerky fashion. Um, there are these things called stick slip models that people use to model earthquakes. Pretty sure that's relevant here as well, but uh, that's an open problem. Maybe one of you would like to think about it. Um, so now I'd like to talk about these domains and these domain walls and explain to you how we model them and understand them. And then I'll explain how this connects to the current excitement about topological insulators as well. Um, so for that, I want to back up and discuss um, these ideas of symmetry and symmetry breaking uh, that were introduced that are sort of a basic fundamental part of condensed matter physics now that were introduced uh, by Landau and his school. So here's a famous cartoon of Landau uh, talking to his students, which was made by one of the students. Uh, so it's kind of amusing. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, let's, let's talk about these ideas of symmetry breaking and then get back to bilayer graphene based on that. So instead of talking about graphene, uh, I want to talk about a magnet, which is the simplest kind of symmetry breaking system. And these ideas, I should say, of symmetry breaking and uh, in, in phys physics are very profound and very wide ranging, because these same ideas 
were later adapted into particle physics um, in the form of the Higgs mechanism and other symmetry breaking ideas. So, so it's very universal physics. Uh, but let's talk about magnets. So let's imagine we have a long molecule, which is magnetic. And let's assume that the, so it's only one dimensional, our system for simplicity. And we'll assume that the magnetization points along the axis when it's magnetized. Um, so this is called an easy axis magnet. The magnetization is forced to be either along, you know, one way along the molecule or to the left or to the right. Um, so the magnetization is just a real number then, positive if it's to the right, negative if it's to the left. And uh, in, a, in, in Landau's approach, you, you say that the free energy of the system depends on what the magnetization is. Uh, so the free energy depends on two things. There's a gradient term in this formula, uh, the first dm by dx term. So this says that if the, if the free energy changes from place to place, that costs you energy. It's better if the magnetization stays constant. That's lower energy. And the other term says that the magnetization likes to be at this value eta, uh, which is non-zero. So there's a potential energy, uh, which in the equation is written as m squared minus eta squared, that quantity squared, it's the second term of the free energy formula. But you can see in the picture what this function looks like as well. And you can see that the minima are at plus and minus eta. So as far as the potential energy is concerned, you minimize the potential energy by making the magnetization equal to plus or minus eta. So you can see that the ground state of the system um, is a state of broken symmetry. There's two ground states. In one ground state, the magnetization is constant and equal to eta. In the other ground state, the magnetization is constant and is equal to minus eta. So, um, OK, so that's the ground state. Uh, now, the, the, these states called uh, domain walls or solitons, which are states where, suppose you have this long magnet and you force the magnetization to be minus eta far away to the left, and you make it equal to plus eta far away to the right. Um, so on both sides, it's quite happy in terms of the potential energy. But in between, what's going to happen? Well, the magnetization is going to have to change continuously from minus eta to plus eta. And uh, there's a sort of minimum energy way to do that. The minimum energy way is to do it quite slowly, because if you do it abruptly, it will cost you a lot of grad gradient energy. On the other hand, if you do it too slowly as a function of x, if you do it very gradually, then there's a large region where the magnetization is not at its optimum value. So that also costs you energy. So there's a sort of competition between the two energies, which determines how wide the domain wall is. You can actually write down an equation, a differential equation, that tells you what the minimum energy configuration would be, because you just use variational calculus. You minimize the free energy expression. And when you solve that equation, you get the profile of the magnetization. You get the profile of the, how the magnetization changes from one ground state to the other. Um, and this place where it's changing is called the domain wall or the soliton, and you can work it out completely. And this, it's, it's quite a beautiful piece of mathematics. OK, so I'm going to skip over this. Uh, the main thing I wanted to explain was this idea of a domain wall, the idea that the two ground states for the magnet. And if you go between them, then you get a domain wall. Uh, there's another idea I want to explain, which is uh, if you have an easy plane magnet. So now let's assume that our magnet is actually like some flat planar object. It's just some film, and it's a magnetic material. Uh, we'll assume now that the magnetization can lie in the in the xy plane, which is the plane of our of our magnet. Um, so the magnetization has two components, mx and my. And again, you can write down an expression for the free energy. The main thing is there's a gradient cost. The magnetization likes to be uniform if possible. If it changes from place to place, that costs you energy. And there's a potential energy, which looks like what's called a symmetry breaking potential or a wine bottle potential, it's called these days, um, which is the, this picture I've drawn uh, on the extreme left. Um, so you can see that the minimum value is a circle. Anywhere on that circle is good. Circle of radius eta, um, that will minimize. So there's a lot of ground states now. The ground state, uh, the set of ground states is that the ground state manifold is that circle I've drawn over there. Um, but it, it turns out you can also create things called vortices, which are um, uh, with the following idea, that if you uh, walk around the boundary of your magnet, let's assume our magnet is a circle, and that's shown in the figure on the bottom right. So in the xy plane, we have our magnet, which is shown as a big circle. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm looking at what the magnetization is when I'm at the boundary of this magnet. At the boundary, we expect that the magnetization should be in one of its ground state values. Otherwise, the energy would be uh, infinite. So we want the want it to be at the value at, at somewhere on the circle. 
So I've drawn the circle on the right um, uh, in, the, in the magnetization plane. And the thing is that as I, as I walk around the physical boundary of the magnet, the circle in the XY plane, the magnetization in the magnetization is somewhere on the circle um, uh, drawn to the right. And so if, if, if it turns out that the magnetization goes around the circle once every time I walk around the magnet, the magnetization also goes around the circle once. That's called a configuration of winding number one, and that's a vortex. Um, in practice, what a vortex looks like is what I've shown over there. The field lines form circles. Um, so these are called topological defects, and they're the analogs of domain walls in these planar XY magnets. And we'll see that bilayer graphene, mechanical bilayer graphene, contains both kinds of things, domain walls and vortices. The picture of that spurting liquid, I'll skip over that. Um, but it turns out that these ideas, like I said, are very universal. They apply in particle physics. They apply to superfluid helium. So it's not just about magnets. And of course, we're going to talk about how these ideas apply to bilayer graphene. OK, so, so with, without further ado, then, I want to describe the model that we introduced for bilayer graphene. And um, I'm assuming I have about 15 more minutes. Is that, would that be a safe assumption? All right, so I'll assume I have about 15 more minutes. So uh, I'll, yes. yes. OK, very good. Uh, I think that'll be OK. We'll, we'll talk about the jammed solids more briefly. Um, and I'll focus more on bilayer graphene, which I think is very interesting. So our basic model is um, we, we consider the AA configuration as our basic configuration. And then uh, what we want to focus on is the displacement of the two sheets of bilayer graphene relative to this AA configuration. So the key uh, quantity over here is the displacement field, which is how much you displace the two layers relative to each other, starting from an AA configuration, which corresponds to u equal to 0. What we'd like to ask is, first of all, as you move the two sheets relative to each other, what's the potential energy of the system? I've already mentioned that if the sheets are on top of each other, when u is 0, uh, it's costly energetically, because those carbon atoms don't like to be close to each other. Um, and the question now is, as you begin to shift the sheets, how will that potential energy change? And you can, as you might imagine, if you displace it by any of these amounts shown in the figure to the right, E1, E2, E3, E4, and so on, um, if you displace it by any of those amounts, then the energy gets to a minimum. Because in those configurations, one of the atoms in the upper layer is really happy because it's really far away from all the others. It's in the middle of the hexagon. The other one's still unhappy, but that's the best you can do. So uh, and the other thing you can realize about the potential energy is that it must be periodic as a function of u. So once you know what the potential energy is within that dotted tile over there, you can figure out what it is for other displacements just by periodicity. So the key thing is to figure out what's the potential energy as a function of u within the dotted tile. And so the way we figured out what this function is, uh, there's an honest way to do it where you could try and do an electronic structure calculation. But we just tried to think of a function that's periodic and that um, has the right properties. Namely, it has minimized those six points, and it has a maximum at the origin. And there's one really simple function you can write down. And this is based on the idea of a reciprocal lattice, which if you've done solid state, you're familiar with. And if you're not, um, you know, my student was able to learn all of this stuff. She, obviously, she hadn't done solid state physics, but she was able to figure this out in a week. And indeed, uh, it, you know, it's, it's nicely discussed in solid state physics books. Uh, there's a theory of how you can write down periodic functions with any periodicity of a given Brave lattice. And so we wrote down the simplest function that had the right periodicity. And it turned out the simple function also had the right properties of having its maxima and minima in the right places. So there's just one free parameter over here, which is this quantity c. And we conjectured that the potential energy has this form. Um, now, it turns out that people have done electronic structure calculations. And they do find that the form we guessed is, in fact, uh, what happens in nature. But we didn't really bother with uh, doing that. We just guess the form. And that's what you do in a typical Landau theory. You work with, you guess the form of the free energy consistent with the symmetries of your problem. And that's what we're doing here. We can estimate that the scale of this energy is 1 milli electron volt. Uh, because I'm a little bit short of time, I can come back and explain to you why that's the energy scale uh, at the end, if you like. Um, and then this potential repeats itself. Um, but what you see is that it's, it looks a little bit like a symmetry breaking potential, like the wine bottle potential I was talking about, because it's got this big bump in the middle, uh, just like the wine bottle potential does. And then it's got these minima. Uh, the minimum, instead of being a circle, is a hexagon. And the other thing is that the hexagon isn't completely 
you know, the potential isn't quite zero. Uh, if you're kind of attentive, you can see the little bumps as you walk along the hexagon. Maybe I can point to this over here. The actual minima are the corners of the hexagon. And if you move along one of the edges of the hexagon, the potential rises a little bit and then it falls again. And uh, you can sort of see that in this picture, uh, I hope. Um, yeah. OK, so that's what the potential looks like. It's like a symmetry breaking potential, uh, but it's got bumps along the minimum. OK, so then there's also a gradient energy cost. And uh, here you can sort of crack open a book on elasticity. And uh, you discover that there's basically two terms in the gradient energy cost. One that depends on the divergence of your displacement field. The other that depends on the square of the curl. And so this is the total um, free energy that we wrote down. And then we try to minimize this free energy. And what we discover is, um, in a nutshell, we solve this. So we try to we write down the free energy equation. Oh, sorry, where is that gone now? Yeah, here it is. We write down. We minimize the free energy, so we get a differential equation, and we solve it subject to the boundary conditions that there's a wall, and that far away from the wall, it's pure AB or pure BA. So the displacement looks like um, what I've shown in the picture. It's just a BA displacement when you're far away from the wall, and it's an AB displacement when you're near the wall. And in between, uh, the wall I've shown is infinitely thin, so it just changes abruptly. A real wall will have some width, and that's our goal to figure out. But we solve the, we try to figure out how the displacement changes across the wall um, uh, with these boundary conditions using our free energy expression. Now, in a tensile wall, the change in the displacement is perpendicular to the wall. And in a shear wall, which I've drawn to the right, um, again, you have an AB and a BA layer on the, on the two sides. But the change in the displacement now is parallel to the wall on the two sides. And we can show that those are the only two possibilities. So then we can go ahead and calculate the profile of the wall. Um, it turns out that the profile has the same form, um, but the widths are, are different. And we can calculate what those widths are. And uh, the, the, the amazing thing is that the ratio of those two widths doesn't depend on the parameter C which describes the potential energy landscape of our system, which we don't actually know because it was just a conjectured form. It depends only on these elastic constants, k and kappa and mu, which are actually known for graphene. So in this way, we were able to account for this data of uh, Alden et al. On the, oh, sorry, this is going to be crazy yeah, over here. We were able to calculate the ratio of these widths without any parameters to fit. And we were also able to fit the actual profiles and from that, we could extract what the parameter C is. And it came out to be about a milli electron volt, which is what you expect. So that shows that this model is working. So that's the nice thing. Now, this model also predicts the existence of, uh, of vortices, because uh, a vortex would basically be that as you walk around the boundary of your bilayer graphene layer, um, you walk around the hexagon in the uh, displacement space. And uh, and you can see that as you walk around that hexagon, as you walk across each bump, you're actually crossing a domain wall. And so you can see that these vortices would have domain walls associated with them, and the domain walls would meet meet at the core of the vortex. Our model also predicts that there'd be other kinds of vortices, what we call fractional vortices, where just two domain walls meet. And the interesting thing is that although the paper didn't mention this, um, in their data, Alden et al. actually do see a lot of these fractional vortices also. So, so that's some of the nice stuff that came out of our model, that it's quantitative um, explanation of their experiment, and it predicts these other kinds of uh, domain walls uh, of vortices, which have also been seen. Um, it's also nice because if you're interested in particle physics and cosmology, um, similar things have been predicted. Uh, so this picture just shows you these fractional vortices that we predict, and that are actually seen in the data as well. <clears throat> but um, uh, but but so all of this is nice. We sort of are able to explain the experiment. But here's the best part of this of this model. We can also analyze the dynamics of the two layers, and this is just f is equal to ma that I've written down over here. Sigma is the mass density of the graphene sheets, and so the left hand side is the ma side of the equation, and the right hand side is the force because the free energy um, it's functional derivative with respect to the displacement. If you think about it, that's actually the force acting on any given point. Uh, and if you're doing equilibrium analysis like we were before, you'd set it equal to zero, and that's how we analyze the domain walls. But we can also analyze the vibrations of the sheets relative to each other. So because I'm a little short, short of time, 
Um, I'll just describe this rather qualitatively and not go too much into the details, which I'm happy to discuss um, in the in the Q and A. But what we find is that if if you've just got these sheets and they're stacked right on top of each other, if you're in the A B phase, um, let's say it's a pure A B phase, no domain walls right now, um, then you can analyze the relative vibrations of these two sheets of graphene, and it turns out you can create waves in the system. And you can calculate what the dispersion relation of these waves is. You can calculate how the frequency of these waves varies with wave vector. And it turns out that there's two kinds of waves. There's shear waves and tensile waves. In a tensile wave, the displacement of the two sheets is perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is propagating. So these are like transverse waves in electromagnetism. And the shear waves are what we call longitudinal waves. These are waves in which, um, actually, I've got it backwards. The tensile wa waves are the longitudinal ones. The shear waves are the transverse ones. So in a longitudinal wave, which is tensile, the displacements are parallel to the wave vector. But both these waves have, and they travel at different speeds. All of that comes out of the model, out of solving this equation. Um, you linearize the equation around the equilibrium, and then you solve it. Um, and then it's a linear equation, which you can solve. So it contains all these waves. But the interesting thing is that these waves are have a gapped dispersion relationship, by which I mean that if the wavelength becomes infinite, if the wave vector goes to 0, then the frequency is non-zero. Why is that? Um, well, that's easy to understand because a zero wave wavelength uh, wave basically means you're just shifting the two sheets relative, rigidly relative to each other. You're not deforming the sheets. You're just moving them. You're just sliding them past each other. And we know that an AB or a BA configuration is an equilibrium. So if you move it away, there'll be a restoring force and it'll just undergo simple harmonic oscillations. And that's what this frequency big omega is, the gap in their dispersion. OK, so if you have an AB or a BA mode, um, you have uh, waves, and they're gapped. What, what, and and you, we can estimate what this parameter is, again, from our model, from the thickness of the domain walls. So that's the nice thing, that once we've got that one model fit, we can make predictions uh, based on that, which can be tested. OK, but the fun thing is that if you look at a domain wall, it turns out that there are modes uh, of the uh, modes of vibration that are localized to the domain walls. Uh, what are these modes? Well, one of these modes just corresponds to the domain wall slushing back and forth or kind of undulating. And the other mode corresponds to the domain wall growing thicker and thinner. Uh, this mode that corresponds to the domain wall growing thicker and thicker, thinner um, is a, a breathing mode, and it also has a gap, although the gap is smaller than for the bulk modes. But the, the, the mode that corresponds to the domain wall just slushing back and forth that, that mode is actually gapless. So if the wavelength becomes infinite, um, that mode which propagates along the wall uh, does so with zero frequency. And that's easy to understand also because the domain walls can be put anywhere, really. So if you shift them, it's just like the triangular molecule. It has a zero frequency mode because it's got translation problems, translation invariance. So, so those are some of the things that come out of our model that we have. Uh, but but then that, this, is the, this is the cool thing because what we've got over here is that the vibrational modes, so the waves that propagate in this material, in the bulk, they have a gap. On the boundary, there are gapless modes. There are linearly dispersing gapless modes. And this is exactly what the electronic states are like in a topological insulator. In the bulk of a topological insulator, the electronic states have a gap. It's a semiconductor. Um, and then in the bulk, on the boundary, there are gapless modes. It's a metal, so it's, uh, the surface is metallic. Um, and it seems that this, what our system, therefore, is what's called a is is a mechanical topological insulator. And so far as I'm aware, it's the only system that's a naturally occurring material, which is a mechanical topological insulator. So I think that's pretty exciting. Okay, I'll skip over this part where we try to connect the connect the zero mode to actual topology and show that it's related to topological insulators that people study in context of electronic properties normally. What we do is we use this mechanical supersymmetry I mentioned right at the start of the talk. We use that to take the square root of our bilayer graphene mechanics problem. And then we show that it turns into a Dirac equation, uh, which uh, uh, has been classified as topological insulators. So what's the takeaway? Well, the main takeaway is that if you put two sheets of graphene on top of each other, there's an interesting degree of freedom, which is the relative displacement. And we formulated a theory of that relative displacement and its dynamics. We find that the equilibrium relative displacement is, of course, an AB or a BA configuration. 
but that you can have domains where it's A, B, and B, A, and domain walls between them. And our model allows us to analyze those domain walls. The other thing our model allows us to do is to analyze waves of relative displacement. And if you're in a pure A, B, or B, A system, or if you're well away from its boundaries, then the waves are have a gapped dispersion. But if you're at the boundary, there are these localized modes that are localized at the boundary, which are gapless. That's the story um, of the mechanics of bilayer graphene. Um, all of this could fold into the physics of the electronic system, which is what there's so much excitement about because it's superconducting and it's um, possibly um, also insulating. And so there are all these interesting phenomena and the couplings of these edge modes are surely, these boundary modes are surely going to be of relevance to that. Jammed solids. I'm just going to take five minutes, if I may, to tell you what the story here is. Uh, jammed solid is like a granular material. If you think about like a pile of rice, uh, what is it really considered as an assembly of rice, you know, of, of rice grains? Um, is it a solid or is it a fluid? It seems solid enough if you have a pile of rice or a pile of coffee beans because it stays put. It's not changing its shape. Um, and it's got a shape of its own, which is a conical pile maybe that you've created. And if you push it a little bit, uh, it won't it won't shift. I mean, if you push it hard, of course, you can. But if you push it gently, nothing will happen. So it's got all the properties of a solid. But you can pick up the rice or coffee beans in your hand and then just drop them and they'll flow out of your hand like a liquid. So the point over here is that granular materials, which are macro materials made up of mac macroscopic particles, but not quite Avogadro's number of them, but a lot of them, um, these are very far from equilibrium systems. And they defy understanding because one can't apply the principles of statistical mechanics to them. Normally, if you have a gas of molecules, um, at first you think that's a very hard problem because you have this Avogadro's number of molecules, but we've known since the 19th century that equilibrium statistical mechanics, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, and so on, apply to these systems. They have all these different states available to them, and they explore those different states so we can average over those states and figure out the properties of the gas. The trouble with granular materials is these particles just sit there. They don't go anywhere. So there's no averaging that can be performed. And so strangely enough, um, you know, I was talking about topological insulators and bilayer graphene and, you know, and particle physics, and that's cutting edge science. But just understanding a pile of rice, that's also cutting edge science. And so there are all these beautiful experiments that study what are called the vibrational modes of, of these materials in what's called the jammed state. So to create a jammed state, what you do is you imagine you've got this material flowing down a chute or something. But as it piles up, uh, eventually the flow will stop. And uh, that's the jammed state. And so it's especially interesting to look at the vibrational modes and their, the density of modes when you're in the jammed state. And this is a problem that uh, there's a lot of experiments and simulations on, but very little understanding of it. Although there seem to be some quite universal features um, across jammed solids and even glasses. So what we've tried to do is to, we've tried to come up with a random matrix theory um, of what the vibrational modes of a jammed solid are. Random matrix theory was developed in the 1950s um, to understand complex quantum spectra. So again, there's this connection between the classical problem, the vibrational modes of a jammed solid are a classical problem, and uh, we're trying to apply ideas that were developed in quantum mechanics. So this was developed to understand nuclear physics, but it was applied more broadly later on in quantum, quantum mechanics as well. Uh, the idea is that if you have a complex system, you model it as a completely random matrix, and it turns out that indeed this gives you a good statistical model of uh, a lot of things, um, including um, atomic nuclei, which was set out to solve. So we come up with a model of uh, what we do is to jump cut to the chase. Uh, we recognize that the vibrational problem can be written in the form A transpose A, and we assume that A is a Gaussian random matrix. So this is a new kind of random matrix, different from what's used in quantum mechanics. All the mathematicians have studied it, and they call it a Laguerre ensemble. So we can draw upon a lot of the existing math. And what this picture shows is that it gives a pretty good account of the data um, on, on the vibrations of jammed solids. So obviously, we're quite excited the fact that um, we're able to account for uh, the properties of jammed solids. Uh, so this plot actually shows the comparison between the vibrational frequencies of a pack of beads and the predictions of random matrix theory. And it's exciting that one can understand some of these things. Uh, I should also explain that there's a lot, I should also say, in fairness, that there's a lot that 
we can't capture with a random matrix model. So, um, but, but like I said, if you can understand anything about granular materials, um, it's cause for, cause for celebration. Okay, so that's the, that's my overall story. I wanted to uh, talk about uh, specifically about mechanical topological defects and 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 mechanical uh, topological insulators. I believe it's not just bilayer graphene, but in fact, almost all two D materials uh, are likely to exhibit these kinds of effects. So, uh, so, so these are ideas that are likely to see a lot of application in in, in coming years. Uh, the problem of jammed solids and granular materials is a very difficult and interesting problem, and frustrating because it's so um, you know it's just like really everyday materials, easy to study, but we can't understand them. But we made a little bit of progress using random matrix theory on the on, on the spectra of jam solids. And again, I should emphasize that it's a number of groups. Uh, I'd get time to do justice to the entire literature uh, in this very very lightning review of uh, our work. Um, so it's an interesting problem that a lot of people are working on. And and that's my message that there are important unsolved problems in the everyday world of classical physics. And so one doesn't need to build a giant accelerator uh, in order to see new physics. Uh, is, is is the point of the story? It's done. All right, I'll stop here. I'm a little bit over time, so thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I think the student and viewers have learned a lot of things. So we have got a few questions in, in inbox and in comment section. So first, I'll go in inbox. So what is bilayer graphene? Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry, I missed the. Could you, could you just uh, ask? Say the start of the question. Yeah, it's, it's just definition. So, what is the bilayer graphene? That's okay. Yeah. So, bilayer graphene is when you take two sheets of graphene and you put them on top of each other. Uh, you can also create trilayer graphene where you put three sheets on top of each other. And if you put a very large number of sheets on top of each other, you would basically be back to graphite, which is a well-known form of carbon. It's the form of carbon that's in your pencil lead and so on. So actually, the challenge in creating graphene originally was how do you go from graphite to just a single sheet of uh, of graphene, and that was done in a very interesting way using Scotch tape. And you know, people won the Nobel Prize for this discovery. Um, so this is work by Geim and uh, in Geim's lab. Uh, they just take pencil lead, they sprinkle it onto Scotch tape, and they fold it shut, and then they pull it open, and they just do that a few times. And remarkably, you can just pull off single sheets of carbon. Um, for a while, that was the exciting thing, just working with single sheets. Now we find that maybe putting two or three of them together creates more interesting structures, which is related to some of the questions some of you were asking earlier about uh, tunneling between the two sheets and uh, how that creates uh, um, some interesting electronic properties. Okay, sir, thank you. We have another question. So what is a jamming transition? Yeah, so OK, so that, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I feel, feel like I didn't really uh, do a very good job of that. The idea is that if you have a, uh, if you have a granular material, um, as you remove part, let's say you've got a pack of, you know, let's say peas or something, and you put them into some cylindrical container, you've got all these peas. Um, they're jammed together, uh, they're at high density, but as you start to remove the particles one by one, at some point the structure will collapse and it'll start to flow. Um, and so just before it starts to flow is the jammed state. And then uh, if you remove a particle and you destabilize it so that it, it collapses and flows, um, then it goes into this flowing state. Um, so that, that's the jammed state of granular materials. This is really a delicate state where um, you've got these irregularly arranged, irregularly shaped particles, and you've got them at sufficiently low density that they're on the brink of instability. Thanks, sir. So we have another question. So how high harmonic generation is used to probe the ultra fast electron dynamics at uh, at a second uh, time scale in bilayer graphics? Yeah. So. Um, Right, so, so this is a question that was asked earlier as well. Um, this is actually not, uh, I mean, I guess I, 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 won't, I wanted to answer this because I, I don't really work on, uh, on uh, harmonic generation. Um, but you should perhaps invite, uh, uh, I mentioned the Cornell Group's experiments. Um, maybe you should consider inviting uh, some of them. First of all, of course, uh, McEw McEwen uh, is the director of the lab there and 
his group did that experiment that I was describing, and they do a lot of beautiful work. So I think that that people, yes. yeah. yeah. But but the right there uh, yes. that works on on precisely the kind of thing you're talking about harmonic generation. So so you should, yeah. There may be another similar question uh, so about uh, in twisted bilayer graphene. Do the quasi particles state in two distinct uh, graphene layers exhibit neutron-like oscillation? Yeah, that's an interesting analogy. So within within a single layer of graphene, uh, the quasi particles are described by the Dirac equation. And then if you tunnel between the layers, you are indeed undergoing oscillations between being in this layer or that layer. If you, you could regard those as different flavors of this Dirac-like particle, and so then you've got flavor oscillations. So yes, absolutely right, that uh, there's a beautiful analogy between neutrino oscillations and um, electrons and graphene. Yeah, thank you, sir. This may be the last question, sir. So what is the topological insulator? Yeah, so just in terms of the phenomen phenomenology, a topological insulator is a material which in the interior is insulating, and uh, that's because it's got a band gap. And so, so of course, this we're familiar with from introductory you know, modern physics, that if you have a solid, um, the energy levels come in bands. If, you have, if the bands are all filled, um, then, uh, then the material is insulating. Or it might be a semiconductor if the lowest unfilled band is not very high energy, so you can excite particles across. Uh, but, if, but at low temperature, it's basically a semiconductor is also an insulator. So if you have filled bands, it's an it's a insulator. Uh, this has sort of been the can canon of physics. This is what people have believed for you know 60 years or so uh, since the quantum theory of solids was established. But the surprising discovery in the 2000s was that some of these things that are band insulators, um, their surfaces are metallic. So in the boundary, in the interior, it's an insulator, but the surface is required to be metallic. Uh, on the surface, the band structure changes, and it's got uh, you know it's it's it, you've got it's not exactly that you have a partially filled band, but the, the band gap between the two bands closes with the boundary. Uh, why this happens is because of some very subtle topological aspects of the band structure. And so that's why these things are called topological insulators. Uh, so it's a good name. There's topology involved, they're insulators, but it misses out on the fact that the surface is conducting. So that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you, sir, uh, for your wonderful presentation and discussion session, sir. So I think students have learned a lot of things about the classical analogy of quantum phenomena. And uh, you have also explained about the jam solid and BLG. So uh, the main aim of our program is to motivate and encourage our students. I think they, uh, they have motivated by your lecture. And uh, I hope uh, some of our students and viewers will uh, feel interested in this research and uh, will join later. Uh, so thanks again, sir, for accepting our invitation and giving us this opportunity to add in such an important webinars and hope, hopefully we can add another webinar uh, in the near future and uh, after the covid we'll definitely invite you for a festival -face session so yeah. thanks sir yeah Bye for today. well th thank you very much it was a pleasure to be here and uh, i look forward to remaining so in honor, sir. Yeah. yeah of course sir. i'll inform you sir about that. bye sir okay goodbye have a nice day sir too.